Okay. <clears throat> Cherry cough syrup helps. What I'm about to read, uh, <clears throat> what, I'm about, what I'm about to read is a story taken from a collection of short stories from a manuscript entitled Urban Nomads. The action happens on St. Julian Street, 4th Avenue, to, to be exact, not too far from the Mission, downtown. My lead uh, narrator for this is a guy named Liquor Store Rufus. And I'm sure you'll recognize his voice as he goes in and out of the, of the piece. Lots of stuff happens on St. Julian. For example, this is where Sylvester and Marlena Green started their honeymoon tent thing. Sylvester and Marlena were good people. Nobody, no doubt about that. But they had been down in their luck, and I guess you would say, in desperate, in, in, in desperate straits for a while. But they hadn't been stripped of lots of ideas of creativity, not by a long shot. Sylvester, I got an idea that can make us some money. Sylvester stopped sipping his thrice brewed tea heated on the one burner hot plate and gave Marlena his complete attention. But Marlena said, make us some money. It meant, listen close. Well, she had mine, baby. He loved to see her eyes brighten up and the way her hands started doing little catch cradles as she talked about an idea. Okay, <clears throat> here we are. In this tent, one of the biggest and nice on the block. You agree with that? You got that right, sweet thigh. He made an elaborate sweeping gesture with his right hand as though to salute their surroundings. Their daily clothes hung up neatly on a crossbar. Their neatly fold stored clothes on a makeshift shelf in the east corner. A few glasses, cups, and saucers placed on the ground level, the one burner hot plate and the old-fashioned metal bread box where they stored their perishables and to keep the wrath away. So what's on your mind? He smiled as he asked the question. Molina's ideas could be a little bit abstract at times. He had learned to be cautious about what her ideas were likely to, to take them. Okay, so here's my idea. I've been thinking real hard on this for a while. I know you have, sweet thing. I know you have. My idea is that we rent our tent out for an hour at a time to some deserving couple who can pay the price. Sylvester almost choked on the tea he was sipping. <coughs> Marlena, baby, did I hear you right? You want to rent our tent, our home out by the hour? Is that what you said? That's exactly correct. That's what I just said. Now, let me explain this to you. Sylvester sprawled back on his futon sleeping bag and stared at his wife, eloquently moving lips. The woman was endlessly fascinating, her mind percolating like a pot of strong, brewing coffee. He had no doubt that they would get out of the fix they were in, largely because of her strength, determination, and imagination. They hadn't willed themselves to be on skid row. It just happened. After a series of catastrophes has gone down, both of them losing their good-paying jobs at the same time, his hip replacement, her fight with breast cancer, the bills that swamped them, the fight that they lost to keep the house, one damn thing after another. Sylvester, are you listening to me? He took a sip of his cold tea. 
and nod it enthusiastically. Yes, 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 I am. Good. Okay. Ain't no sense trying to deny it. Just because people are living on what they call schedule does not mean that they do not want to make love. You agree with that? So Preston licked his lips, squinched his eyes into a lascivious slit, and did a salacious stare at Marlena's full breast and her shapely headline. She leaned over and gave him a playful slap on his forehead. I ain't talking about us, Mr. Sex Maniac. I'm talking about some of our neighbors. Now I know for a fact that men don't really care where they get a nut. Women are different. Women don't want to be doing it on a piece of cardboard in the middle of the night out on the streets. Women want something soft under themselves. Maybe some candlelight under a little music. You know what I'm saying? Sylvester nodded in agreement. I hear you, sweet thing. I hear you loud and clear. So look around you. Look at what we got and what they don't have. Sylvester glanced around at the interior of their neatly laid out tender home. The centerpiece was this incredible mattress that a couple of their drug-addicted neighbors had sold them a couple of months ago. One of those world-class numbers that was firm and guaranteed to stay firm no matter what for at least a hundred years or until uh, it collapsed. No telling where the dopey had stole it. So, he framed his question in an oblique fashion. So, I'm suggesting that we rent our tent, rent this magic mattress out for two or three hours a week, except for the weekend. <laughs> Why not the weekend? Because the weekends will be reserved for us, the owners of the love tent, to count our money and do whatever. Where it gets round quick on Skid Row. It took Marlena's idea exactly one whole week to sink into action. The honeymoon tent was on. Sylvester eased in with the suit suggestions. With a with a with a fool with a few suggestions. Uh Marlena, baby cakes. I don't think we should charge everybody the same price for an hour in paradise. Why don't we charge with the traffic in bad? Marlene Green, a bona fide capitalistic entrepreneur, had to be convinced that they would lose business, trade, if they tried to charge a set amount for each use of their tent mattress home. Charge with the traffic in bad? Okay, well, okay. I guess that would be the best thing to do. All right, Sylvester, let's go with the flow. The flow dictated they would not offer their tent to teenagers. We don't want to be responsible for delinquent stuff. They would not allow prostitution. We'll have to be really alert about this. I don't think we'll have a real problem. I can spot a hoe and a john from a mile away. It took about three months for them to work the kinks out. But it was kind of amazing the way stuff had happened. For example, this particular section became much quieter. It was like nobody wanted to be guilty of disturbing the honeymoon tent. It actually got to the point where some people nicknamed this block the Love Connection. It was almost unbelievable. Marlena was almost on the verge of tears. Sylvester, we made $162.52 this week. It was really unbelievable what happened next. This clean-cut, blonde-haired, blue-eyed couple popped through the flap. We were informed that we could rent this tent for a period of time. Is this correct? It was the guy who spoke. He had a kind of German accent. Where are you folks from? I asked him. Oslo, Norway. So you want the honeymoon tent, huh? Yeah, we want it for two hours, perhaps three. Marlena was all about the business of the business. Now then, who were your references? Oh, we met this couple in Harlem 
who had done some photography here on St. Julian last month and they spoke of you. So what is your reason for wanting to uh, rent the honeymoon tent? We want to do this to say that we have done, we have made love here on St. Julian Street and that the baby we have been trying to conceive for so long will happen here. Marlena blinked back a couple sentimental tears and said, that'll be 200 for two hours. And God bless you. The Norway guy zipped open his money belt and fished out four fifty dollar bills like it was nothing. Three things happened after the, uh, a few months in the spring that tell you that they was really making some decent coins. Number one, they just basically left the rent. What did I say? They basically left the tent and got a room over at the Keystone Hotel. Number two, they hired Mrs. and Mrs. Spencer, an older couple, you might say, to do the landlord thing, meaning that they booked people in and collected their money, the money first. But they didn't become greedy-ass, snake-dog, money-hungry, money-grabbers. They did things for people on the street. If you was having it tight, they might have known you a few coins. Plus, they was known to give scholarships to couples who wanted to do the do, but didn't have the proper coins. Number three, to put the icing on the cake, they lined uh, uh, Bobo up to hang around to be security. He didn't want to mess around with Bobo. Bobo was about 5'10", was almost as wide as he was tall, and had muscles all, back, all up behind his head in between his thumbs and forefingers. Always exercise, always doing push-ups and sit-ups and stuff. Right next to the tent flap of the honeymoon tent. They came down on like an ice raid or something, uh, the way Slava Lip Susie showed it. It was like a SWAT team raid or a Gestapo raid, the way they did when they was taking Jews away to the concentration camp. The only difference, the way she told it, is that these people were wearing suits. What was it? About 7, 7.30 in the morning, and these people, white guys, about 6 or 7, barged into our tent, talking fast and crazy. You are breaking the law. <clears throat> it is unlawful to establish houses of prostitution within the downtown city limits. You are in violation of city ordinance BS 1666. Who do you think you are breaking in here? Fortunately, the lead person started talking really fast. We're from the downtown association of blah, 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 blah. And we demand that you comply with blah, 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 blah. I had an immediate risk, the compromise ready. Get out of here and we can talk. Or else stay where you are and my husband is going to beat the dog shit out of you. They accepted the compromise. We let them wait outside for about a half an hour while we discussed the situation. Sebastian, what do you make of this? It's about money, sweet thing. It's about the almighty buck. Somewhere along the line, somebody has discovered that a couple of poor-ass black folks down on Skid Row are making some money. That's what it's all about, money. We met with these soups outside our tent for a few minutes before they chicken out and flared the scene. It was obvious that they didn't feel too comfortable with slobber lip Susie, Fancy Dan, the Toothless Man, Hellraiser Gonzalez, Uncle Charlie, and the other regulars on San Julian Street crowding up on them. We didn't have to be told that it was on from that point onward. The next day, there was a police sweep on the street. They made a beeline for our tent. We're looking for drugs, contraband. We wouldn't let them pass the threshold. You can't come in here without a search warrant. They were so mad, so mad. If there hadn't been so many people around, they probably would have shot both of us to death. Two hours later, they were back with a search warrant. It was on. 
the cops immediately killed our honeymoon business, so we had to leave the Keystone and move back into the tent. Nobody wanted to run the risk of being arrested, so a lot of our friends stayed away from us. Marlena had worked so hard to put this thing together, and now it was destroyed by some hateful, mean-spirited, dirty, rotten, snake-dog money grabbers. That's what it was all about, really. They just couldn't stand the idea of a black couple making money, doing something they had never thought about doing. Lo and behold, the next thing we knew, we had some young white kids and some young black kids, really just kids, marching up and down on St. Julian Street with signs, protesting for our right to use our tent any way we wanted to. We were flabbergasted. The story hit the newspapers. African-American couple harassed by her bureaucracy. That brought the TV cameras down on San Julian, a place they'd never been before. Tell us, Mr. and Mrs. Green, have you always lived in a tent on San Julian Street? Is it true you were using your tent as a house of prostitution? I felt tempted to pull out my attitude adjuster a few times, but Marlena cooled me out. Be cool, Sylvester, be cool. This kind of BS went on for about a month. It got to the point where we were going to accept the pro bono offer that a couple of cool attorneys had made. I'll represent you guys. This is nothing but an infringement of your civil rights. I'm appalled. It just so happened that the day we were about to get hooked up with David Ziegels, the lawyer, we looked out of our tent and they had these huge bulldozer things moving into position at the end of the street. A big, beefy police sergeant was driving real slow down the street, announcing over a loudspeaker, You have exactly one hour to remove your belongings. You people are trespassing. You have exactly one hour to remove your belongings. I repeat. Marlena cried her eyes out for about five minutes before she pulled herself together. I'm not crying about us. I'm crying about the grief we pulled down on our friends. I don't know how the news reached David Ziegler, but he was on the scene within an hour with some kind of stay of execution order. We can't let them do this. What the hell do they think this is? Nazi Germany? Ziegler was outraged, and I was outraged, but Marlena was cool. Look, guys, this is not going to work. Look at what's happening already. We got protesters coming in. You got police from riot gear and, a, and SWAT vehicles behind them. I don't want to see anybody killed or some craziness like this. Sylvester, pull those shoulder bags out with our stuff and help me pull the tent poles down. It was really and truly a mad scene. Mad. People who were already homeless were being made homeless again. Some people were just standing in front of the cardboard shacks, too stunned to cry. Some people were pushing around, rushing around, piling stuff on top of anything they could pull or push. And then the bulldozer started moving. The police had cordoned off the street for blocks around, but there were individuals who popped through and flung a bottle or a brick at the bulldozer. They got an immediate ass kicking and were dumped into a police van. They left one opening out of St. Julian Street, and I clearly remember two things. We looked like refugees dragging our stuff along, and the attorney, David Ziegels, a hard-bitten guy, was shuffling along beside us, crying and mumbling, I don't believe this. Not in America. I don't believe this. But now here's the booty buster. It seems, while Marlena and Sylvester was being buked, scorned, and mistreated, this, this Norway couple that they had once rented the honeymoon tent to got in touch with them. Got in touch with them 
while they was going through all that madness, invited them to come to Norway. This is the way Slobber Lip Susie, yeah, she's still here, told it. Seeing that this Norway couple had made a baby in the honeymoon tent. Had made the crumb crusher that they've been always trying to make in the honeymoon tent. And when they checked out the YouTube and stuff and saw what Marlena and Sylvester was going through, they invited them to get out of morally corrupt shithole America and come to Norway to work for them as diversity consultants or some such time. Incidentally, they had named the corn crusher a boy, Hendrik St. Julian Hansen. They borrowed some coin from this attorney Ziegels and split. Yeah, it was a hell of a scene, a hell of a scene. Bobo told me they got a letter from last year from Oslo, Norway. They had brought a house next door to Astrid, Garth, and the baby, Hendrik St. Julian Hansen. The folks who pulled them over there. It's still there. All I know about the place is that it's close to Greece. Cold and the witches left hitting. And ain't nobody living on the street the way we got it here. That's all I got to say about that.